Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan, and today we're covering appendicitis. This is one of the most common surgical emergencies, and it's actually the most common abdominal surgery that we do in children. So let's dive into it by going right to that practice question. A nurse is assessing a 10-year-old child who presents with abdominal pain. The parent states that the pain started around their umbilicus, but now it's moved to the right lower quadrant. The child has nausea and has refused to eat dinner. On assessment, the nurse notes rebound tenderness at McBurney's point. Which of the following is the priority nursing intervention? So let's start out as always with the basics. What even is appendicitis? Itis means inflammation and then the first part of the word tells us what actually is inflamed. So appendicitis, just inflammation of the appendix. Now, the appendix itself, it's this small, like, finger-like pouch attached to the cecum. Now, the cecum, remember, that's where the small and large intestines join together. So the appendix, finger-like pouch right there. Now, the appendix itself doesn't seem to really have a critical function. We can obviously live without it. But when it gets blocked, say, by, like, hardened stool, infection, swelling, mucus, whatever it becomes a ticking time bomb. It gets bigger, it gets inflamed, and that does not feel good. Think of the appendix kind of like a tiny little dead end street. If traffic is just flowing normally, no problem, whatever. But if a truck, bacteria, stool, mucus, whatever, blocks the road, well then traffic is going to pile up. And as soon as that pressure builds, causing inflammation and pain, we have an issue. If we leave it untreated, the road is eventually going to overflow, collapse, and spill out its contents everywhere. So if the appendix perforates, it overflows and spills out everywhere, we're going to get all that nasty stool, mucus, bacteria, whatever, all out into the abdomen. And that's going to lead to peritonitis, inflammation of that lining of the abdominal cavity. Big emergency. So let's start out with how we actually recognize it because appendicitis follows a very specific pattern. It usually starts with vague generalized pain around the belly button, umbilicus. That's because the appendix actually shares nerve pathways with the mid-abdomen. Now, usually within 12 to 24 hours, that pain starts moving into the right lower quadrant. Specifically, we have this point about halfway between belly button and right hip bone called McBurney's point. So McBurney, right lower quadrant, the pain migrates there. That's not the only thing to look for, though, because in some people, it's going to stay kind of generalized. We also want to look for nausea and vomiting, but keyword, after the pain starts. If someone comes in and tells me, oh my gosh, I was throwing up, I was so nauseous, and then my belly started hurting, that makes me think gastroenteritis. You've got a stomach bug. But if your belly starts to hurt, then you get nauseous, then that pain moves into the right lower quadrant. Now I'm for sure thinking appendicitis. Okay, what else? Anorexia. We've got this pain, nausea. Of course, we don't want to eat. Now, you guys know I work with kids. So specifically, if a parent comes in and they're like, little Johnny will not eat mac and cheese and he loves mac and cheese, then big red flag. I'm like, obviously something is wrong if Johnny doesn't want mac and cheese. Now, other classic signs are rebound tenderness. That's pain that gets worse when we let go. So we press down, uh, okay, that feels fine. We let go and they're like, ooh, wincing, it hurts, especially in that right lower quadrant. And then also guarding. They're like, oh, don't touch my belly. They're kind of shying away from you. That's called guarding. Tells us that pain, not specific to appendicitis, but all clues that help us think, okay, maybe we're in that direction. So if that's the case, there are a few quick little bedside tests that you can do to help kind of raise how suspicious you are of appendicitis. None of these are going to confirm the diagnosis. They just help you think like, oh, this appendix really does seem like it's angry. 
The first one is called Rosving Sign. This is all about referred pain. You press down on the left lower quadrant, but they're like, ooh, ow, I feel that over on my right side. Why does this happen? Well, when you push on the left, you kind of shift all the belly contents over to the right, and that tugs on the inflamed peritoneum around the appendix, which triggers pain over where the real problem is on that right side. Next, we can try something called psoas sign. This test clues you in if the inflamed appendix is actually irritating our psoas muscle. That muscle runs right alongside the appendix. So, for example, if the client experiences pain when they extend that right leg, it stretches that psoas muscle, which is next to the appendix, and irritates it. You're just irritating and pulling on that inflamed peritoneum. It hurts, and you're like, yeah, appendix is angry. Next, we've got obturator sign. So similar as psoas, but it's just a different muscle. Your obturator muscle, you're going to activate by internally rotating the right hip. So take that right leg, stretch it out to do psoas sign, then turn it inwards, and that's going to stretch the obturator internus muscle. Again, it's right by the appendix, so if the appendix is inflamed, that movement is going to cause right lower quadrant pain. Now, last test, my favorite to do because it's super easy, it's called the heel drop test. Basically, have them stand on their toes and then drop onto their heels. You're just jarring so that you're shifting things around in the belly. And if the appendix is inflamed, it's not going to like that, right? It's going to irritate it. So if the client winces, they guard, they grab their right lower quadrant, your suspicion for appendicitis went up. Remember, none of these tests are proving appendicitis. They're just really good cues for like, oh, if Rob's wings and the obturator sign are positive, I need to let my provider know we have possible appendicitis. So let's go through a case of appendicitis. For me, my most memorable case was a 12-year-old girl who uh, came into the emergency department at first, seemed like just another vague belly ache. She had been dealing with some stomach pain and nausea for three days. She hadn't vomited. To be honest with you, she looked totally bored. She was clearly not thrilled to be in the ER. Uh, and if you asked her, she was like, I don't need to be here. I just have a belly ache. Got a little nauseous. But her parents clued me in that this morning she had spiked a gnarly fever. Her vitals were fine, except that fever was up to 104 Fahrenheit. So that alone tells me, obviously, there's some infection going on. Kids get belly aches all the time. They get nauseous all the time. But the pain came first. Remember, pain comes first in appendicitis. Then she got nauseous. Then she spiked that fever. So I really am thinking, you know, something's infected if she's carrying a 104 fever for multiple days. So let's do our exam, okay? First, I'm like, you know, tell me where it hurts. I'm looking her up and down. She's pointing just right to her umbilicus, belly button right in the middle. And remember, that's very common in early appendicitis. You might not get that right lower quadrant pain until later. So that doesn't rule it in or out. Next, I went ahead and just looked at that belly. Honestly, it wasn't anything too dramatic, possibly a little swollen, but it wasn't like screaming emergency at me. Then I listened, normal bowel sounds. All right, we're looking good. And lastly, time to palpate. So I press down kind of right in the middle of her belly. She seems fine. But as soon as I let go is when she winced and tensed up. So positive rebound tenderness. And let me tell you, she tried to play it cool, but I, I could see in her face when I let go, it definitely hurt. So that led me to think, all right, let me try that heel drop test. I love this one because it's very hard for them to hide on their face when it actually hurts. I'm like, come on, girl, stand up, stand on your tiptoes. If you really don't need to be here, show me you can do this and then drop onto your heels. And her face totally gave it away. It obviously hurt. 
So I knew as I jarred those abdominal contents, something was bothering her. There was inflammation. We had some sort of issue. So with this exam info, the provider went ahead and ordered labs and imaging. The main thing we wanted for labs was a CBC, complete blood count, to see if there was infection, what the white count was. And then for imaging, we started with a bedside ultrasound. That's the least invasive and quickest imaging for appendicitis. But the gold standard for diagnosis is a C. So in the hospital I worked, they liked to start with ultrasound and then move up to CT if they needed to. So we got the labs. I drew a purple top for the CBC. They came back, boom, really high white blood cell count. It was at about 32,000, if memory serves. So for sure, we knew infection. Between a high white blood cell count, a fever, rebound tenderness, and a positive heel drop test, this is enough to make us think we probably have appendicitis. So they do the ultrasound, and there it is, an enlarged inflamed appendix. At that point, it wasn't an emergency, so my provider did order a CT to confirm, and 100%, we had our diagnosis. So I go back to talk with her parents after CT, and let me tell you, the whole mood shifts. We no longer just have a little stomach ache and a 12-year-old that's kind of, you know, annoyed that she's here. Now we have a surgical emergency. The only way to treat appendicitis is to get that appendix out preferably before it ruptures. So appendectomy, ASAP. Now, while we're waiting for surgery, there are a few critical things we need to do. First, they gotta be NPO, nothing by mouth at all, food, drinks, not even ice chips, okay? If they need emergency surgery, we don't want anything in their stomach that could increase all those anesthesia risks. Number two, we do not want heating pads. Heat might seem like a good idea for pain relief, but it increases inflammation. Just think the word inflammation has flame right in there. We don't want more blood going to that area that could possibly cause the appendix to rupture. So same thing for number three, laxatives and enemas. We don't want to move those bowel contents. If the appendix is already swollen and obstructive, adding more pressure by giving a laxative or giving an enema could just be enough to bust that appendix open. So that's three things not to do. No food, no heat, no laxatives or enemas. What do we do? We control the pain because this really is very painful and we've got to get them to surgery. So pain control, IV fluids, and positioning. Typically, they like that right side lying, low fowlers, maybe kind of guarding, clutching at that right belly, but wherever they are comfortable, no positioning is going to fix this. Most importantly, though, while we're treating their pain, getting them fluids and comfortable, we are watching them like a hawk, monitoring those vitals and really monitoring that pain level while we wait for the OR. The big thing we're looking out for are any signs that the appendix could have ruptured or perforated. And the big one there is a sudden relief of pain. If that client was writhing in pain, 9 out of 10, you come back in five minutes later to check on them and they're like, hey, I think I'm ready to go home. I'm, I'm totally fine. That may sound like it's good news, but no, it is not good news. It's a huge red flag that possibly that appendix has ruptured. At that point, the race is on to get them to the OR ASAP so that we can prevent extensive peritonitis since all that icky stuff in the appendix is now out in the abdomen. Now, once the appendix is out, recovery begins. Our job is pretty much preventing complications. We watch out for infection. Are they spiking a fever? Are their white blood cell counts up? We help with early ambulation, moving as soon as we can, helping prevent atelectasis or a post-op ileus. And finally, keeping them NPO until their bowel sounds return. All right, the gut really needs time to wake up after surgery, once we hear those active bowel sounds is when we can start clear liquids and advance from there. All right, so from a vague belly pain to emergency surgery, obviously, as this case shows, appendicitis escalates fast. So your job as the nurse, you've really got to help catch it early, 
prep for surgery, and then of course help make sure that recovery goes smoothly. So all that being said, let's wrap things up with our original question. You, the nurse, are assessing a 10-year-old complaining of abdominal pain. The parent states the pain started around the umbilicus, but has now moved to the right lower quadrant. The child has nausea, they've refused to eat dinner. On assessment, you note rebound tenderness at McBurney's point. So I'm going to give you four interventions. You tell me what is the priority nursing intervention. Is it A, apply a heating pad to the abdomen for pain relief? B, encourage the child to drink clear fluids to stay hydrated. C, prepare for surgery and maintain NPO status. Or D, administer laxatives to relieve possible constipation. Go ahead and say your answer out loud with me. Priority, we're thinking appendicitis, is C. We've got to prepare that child for surgery and keep them NPO. Once we suspect appendicitis, our number one thing to do is prevent rupture. We got to get that appendix out before it becomes a bigger problem. So keep them MPO, monitor them closely, get them to that OR. Applying a heating pad, that might seem like a good idea for pain relief. But remember, we said heat can help with muscle pain. In the case of appendicitis, it's going to increase blood flow to the area making inflammation worse and potentially pushing that appendix over the edge and causing rupture. No heat. And for our next choice, encouraging that client to drink clear fluids, you know, normally hydration is a go, but not if we're suspecting appendicitis, right? They're likely heading to surgery. We gotta keep them NPO. And then lastly, those laxatives, an enema, Super bad idea, rightly. I understand constipation is a possibility, but if the appendix is already inflamed and swollen, increasing that bowel motility with a laxative can cause additional pressure, which again, it might push that little appendix over the breaking point and cause a rupture. So honestly, key takeaway recognize that appendicitis early. Know those signs we talked about, Rosfing's. So as signs, obturator, the heel drop test. And when you see those, you keep that child NPO and prepare for surgery. And if you do that, you may be able to prevent a life-threatening rupture of the appendix. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.